Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning, dear students. Welcome to my class. This is lecture number 14. <coughs> In this lecture, we will be discussing the economic impact of the British rule in India. This lecture is divided into four sessions. Under the first subsection, we will be studying one of the main impacts of the British rule on economic front was deindustrialization. Under the second subsection, we will be discussing commercialization of agriculture. And in the third subsection, we will be studying drain of wealth. And in the last session, we will be discussing the introduction of the railways. Starting with the first subsection, deindustrialization. First of all, let us look at what deindustrialization means. It simply means the decline of the industry, which comes to known as deindustrialization. We will be looking into how deindustrialization happened under the British rule in India. Since the establishment of political power by the British, we know that in 1757 through the Battle of Plassey and in 1765. Through the Treaty of Allahabad after the Battle of Bexar of 1764. After the Battle of Bexar in 1764, in 1765, a treaty was entered into between the British and the Nawab of Bengal, under which the British got the Diwani of Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa. And during this period, that is from 1765 to 1813, it was the period of merchant capitalism. The period from 1765 to 1813 came in known as the period of merchant capitalism. During this period, the main focus of the English East India Company was to purchase Indian goods, indigenously manufactured products. And these products were purchased from India and brought it to Europe and sold there. The profit of the English East India Company was the difference between the purchasing power and its selling price in Europe. And in order to maximize profits from this trade, the English East India Company forced Indian merchants to sell them these indigenously manufactured products at a low price, especially cotton textiles, silks. They were mainly purchased by English East India Company from Bengal. During this period, these indigenously manufactured products were exported from India to Britain. But a change took place in 1813. In 1813, due to industrial revolution in Britain, factories sprang up every nook and corner of Britain. These factories wanted to raw materials to feed their machines. 
as well as they had to sell these goods so raw materials were required and markets were to be found to sell these machine made goods following which they made india as a colony for the supplier of their raw materials to feed the machines in factories in britain as well as to sell their manufactured products with this change in 1813 the process of deindustrialization commenced in india with the industrialization in britain indian markets began to be filled with manchester made british goods especially cotton goods produced in manchester began to be filled with indian markets these manchester made british goods had a certain qualities compared to indigenously manufactured products in india what were the qualities of these machine made british goods one his quality was high compared to hand made indian goods secondly the prices were low compared to indigenously made goods because within no time these goods could be produced with the support of the machines but these indigenously manufactured products in india were hand made goods they required more time to make even a single goods ask the who has made a calculation with regard to the goods from britain to india the cotton goods imported from britain to india in 19 in 1794 its value was 156 the import of these british made goods was 156 in 1794 but it is changed 1 lakh 8824 in 1813 from 1813 onwards the flow of british goods to india increased now the import of british cotton goods also increased from 11 lakh pounds in 1813 to 63 lakh in 1856 from this it is very clear that from 1757 from the battle of plassey to 1813 indian goods were exported from india to britain but from 1813 onwards the british made machine goods imported to india and it began to fill the indian markets and the first stage came in known as mercantile capitalism the second stage which came in known as industrial capitalism and there was also a need to prevent the import of british import to britain the indigenously manufactured products how did the british able to prevent the export of indigenously manufactured products from india to britain it was by imposing heavy duties by imposing heavy duties on indigenously manufactured products for its export from india to britain heavy duties were imposed 
the main intention behind the imposition of this duty on the indian goods exported from india to britain was it to prevent the export of indian goods in 1824 67.5% duty was imposed on indian kali coes a duty of 37.5% was imposed on indian muslins earlier these indigenously manufactured products had great demand but with the process of the industrialization a reverse stage took place what about the duty on sugar it was three times the above the actual cost of production but these high duties on the export of indigenously manufactured goods from india to britain was made to prevent the export of indian goods to britain but from 1813 onwards raw materials these raw materials were required to feed machines in british factories these raw materials cotton and raw silk began to be exported from india and after this manufactured form it was sent back to india and began to fill with the indian markets by this policy india was made one of the suppliers of the raw materials required for british factories as well as a colony to sell the british manufactured products how did it affect the indigenous industries the indigenous industries were adversely affected these indigenously manufactured products could not compete with these british goods as you have been told earlier the prices of british manufactured goods were low compared to these indigenously manufactured goods as well as the quality of the machine made goods was also high so it resulted the decline of the traditional indigenous industries in india why india was experiencing the process of deindustrialization that is as a result of industrialization in britain the british goods began to import to india and these indigenous industries could not compete with the british goods so while britain was undergoing the process of industrialization india witnessed the opposition of deindustrialization thus this change resulted the process of deindustrialization in india during this british period now going through the next economic impact of the british rule it was commercialization of agriculture the british exported indian goods during the period between as you have been mentioned from 1765 to 1813 indigenously manufactured goods were exported from india to britain in a massive scale coincided with the export of indigenously manufactured products from india to britain 
these indigenous manufactured products were also used for other purposes by English East India Company. One was for the purchase of tea from China because tea was not produced in India during this time. The first tea plantation started in Assam only in 1839. So, the British purchased tea from China only in 1839, tea industries started in Assam in 1839. Earlier, the British imported dar large quantities of tea from China. China was the larger supplier of tea. Britain purchased tea from China by giving silver. The Chinese did not want western goods. They wanted only silver. By paying silver to the Chinese, the British purchased tea from China. But even though the Chinese did not want British products, they liked Indian products like ivory, raw cotton and later on opium. The British was able to use these Indian products to sell to the Chinese for the purchase of tea. By controlling Indian trade, the British was no longer required to bring silver for the purchase of tea. These Indian products were exchanged with the Chinese for tea. This system came into known as a triangular trade connecting. Calcutta in India, Canton in China and the British capital London. The profit was spent into the coffers of English East India Company in London. The English East India Company concentrated on the production of indigo cotton, raw silk, opium and pepper. Indigo, cotton and raw silk, they were required for meeting their industrial needs. These were the raw materials which were extensively cultivated in India and exported from India to Britain. In the, 19, in the middle of the 19th century, tea and sugar were also given attention by the British. Initially, they exported silk, cotton and indigo from India to Britain. These raw materials were required for its industrial needs. The raw silk sent from India was used by the British weavers. Since it was not possible for the British to cultivate silk in Britain, so they wanted to get silk from India. The case was also same for cotton. They got raw silk and raw cotton from India to feed the machines in Britain. In addition to export of raw cotton from India to Britain, they also sold this cotton to the Chinese for the purchase of tea. They also smuggled, the British also smug smuggled opium. Even though China enforced the restrictions in the import of opium, 
the british smuggled opium from india to china and they earned a huge profit by in place of food grains these commodities began to be cultivated silk cotton indigo opium these agricultural products were given more attention and these agricultural products began to be cultivated in place of food grains like wheat or rice in 1856 the british exported from india 43 lakh pound worth of raw cotton 17 lakh pound worth indigo were exported from india to britain in the same year 7 lakh worth pound raw silk was also exported from india to britain in 1856 india was made the supplier of these raw materials to the british the indian economic interest was subordinated to the industrial needs of the british what was the net result of the commercialization of agriculture because more attention was given to the production of cotton silk indigo and opium the production of food grains went down food grains production went down more attention was given to the cultivation of these raw materials which were required for the british factories so there was a decline of the production of the food grains it resulted poverty and famines began to be frequently visited the country because of the commercialization of agriculture commercialization of agriculture simply meant that agriculture was made for the commercial interest for the british now the third economic impact of the british rule was drain of wealth drain of wealth simply means unilateral transfer of fund the fund flowed only to the one side this came into known as drain of wealth as you know the britishers came to india as traders from the establishment of the english east india company in 1600 to 1757 the british brought gold and silver as bullion for the purchase of indian goods and for export to britain as you know the difference between the purchasing power purchasing price and the selling price was the profit of the english east india company they brought gold and silver as bullion for the purchase of indian goods during this period between 1600 and 1757 but a change was occurred after the battle of plassey and the battle of bexar in 1757 as in know that through the battle of plassey in 1757 the british was able to defeat siraj ud daula and through the battle of bexar of 
the English was able to defeat Mir Qasim, Shah Alam II, and Nawab Shujaw Dawla of Auth. After which, the British got Diwani rights. in Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. But only till 1757, the British brought gold and silver for the purchase of Indian goods. But after 1757, the British did not bring gold and silver to India. But the export of Indian goods continued as before. From where did the British get the money to purchase Indian goods for a sale in Europe? It was the territorial revenue. The British got with the grant of Diwani rights in 1765. In 1765, through the Treaty of Allahabad, Robert Clive got on behalf of the English East India Company, the right to collect tax from Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. This money was used for the purchase of Indian goods for its sale in Europe. They were not required to bring any gold and silver to India for the purchase of Indian goods for its sale in Europe. After the Battle of Plassey, with the Battle of Plassey, the British got a political power in Bengal. This political power was used for acquiring territorial revenue from Bengal, Bihar and Orissa. This money was used by the British for the purchase of Indian goods and exported to Britain. The surplus money was left with the British. Surplus money means that the money collected by the British from Bengal, Bihar and Orissa minus the money given to Nawab of Bengal, the dues given to the Nawab of Bengal the British was left with surplus money. So, by imposing oppressive taxation methods by the British, high amount of tax was collected from the peasants by the British. So, even after the payment of dues to the Nawab of Bengal, initially the dues was 53 lakh rupees. The British was required to pay 53 lakh rupees to the Nawab of Bengal. Even after the payment of 53 lakh rupees annually to the Nawab of Bengal, the British was left with the surplus money. This surplus money was used by the British for the purchase of Indian goods from Bengal and its sale in Europe. It was in this way the goods from India was exported to Britain. What India did got back in return, India received nothing from Britain. So, after using the territorial revenue by the English East India Company, purchased it, Indian goods and exported to Britain. It was the transfer of funds from only from India to Britain. India did not receive anything back from Britain. The balance of payment was in favor of Britain. The fund was flowed only to one side. This unilateral transfer of wealth came into known as drain of wealth. That is, the fund was drained from India to Britain. 
we have seen only one side of the drain of wealth from India to Britain. In addition to the export of Indian goods, purchase it by using a territorial revenue from Bengal, there were different channels through which Indian wealth was drained out to Britain. Let us have a look at the through of which channels Indian money flowed into Britain. In addition to using the surplus territorial revenue for the purchase of indigenously manufactured products, they also used this money for their military operations against other Indian rulers. You now recall that the Carnatic War. In the third Carnatic War, the Bengal had already become under the control of the British. This immense riches of Bengal were effectively utilized by the British against their military operations against the French in Carnatic. It was because of the immense risk of Bengal, the British was able to defeat the French at the Battle of Wandi Wash. It was because of the immense wealth from Bengal, the British was able to defeat other Indian rulers particularly the Mysoreans and the Marathas. They were defeated mainly because of the control by the British over the immense riches of Bengal. These monies were used by the British for their military purposes against the other Indian rulers as well as against the rival European Europeans like French and the Dutch. In 1759, in Bengal, Robert Clive completely defeated the Dutch once for all. The Dutch never revived from their failure. All these became possible because of the control of the immense wealth of Bengal by the British. In addition to military operations, the surplus revenue from Bengal was also used for investing money in different types of business, especially its tea industry with China and Chinese silk for the purchase of Chinese silk and Chinese tea. This Indian money was used. Till the 1840s, the British used it to purchase tea from China. This was the condition from 1765 to 1813. In 1813, a change took place. The Charter Act was passed by the British Parliament in 1813. There were four Charter Acts. These Charter Acts were passed at the regular interval of 20 years. The first Charter Act was passed in 1793 and the second Charter Act was passed in 1813 and after the interval of 20 years another Charter, Charter Act was passed by the British in 1833. And the last Charter Act was passed after 20 years in 1853. Under the Charter Act passed by the British Parliament in 1813, the monopoly of English East India Company in trade with India came to an end. With the passage of this Charter Act, 
other Britishers and British companies were able to come to India for trade. But the tea trade with China was again monopolized by English East India Company. But in 1813, the monopoly of the English East India Company in trade with the India came to an end. Now, the other companies also came forward to India for trading purposes. In addition to the English East India Company, the British officials also engaged in private trade and sent the profit in the form of bills of exchange to Britain. Bills of exchange to Britain. It was another channel through which Indian money was drained out to Britain. One, by using Indian money, they purchased indigenously manufactured products and went to Britain. In addition to that, the officials of the English East India Company also engaged in private trade and amassed huge wealth and sent it to Britain. As you have been told earlier, in 1813, the monopoly of English East India Company in trade with India came to an end. Other British companies and Britishers came to India for trade. So, with the decline of trade, the territorial revenue or the land tax was the main stay of the English East India Company in India. Not all profits sent to Britain was from business alone. In addition to this profit from trade, that is both the company officials as well as the English East India Company engaged in trade and got to profit and sent it to Britain. In addition to this profit from trade, wealth drained out from India to Britain through other channels as well. It included the plunder and war beauty. As you now recall that after the fall of Tipu Sultan, in the third round of struggle between the English and the Mysorean ruler, the English officials engaged in plundering of Siranga Patanam. So, plunder was one way through which Indian wealth was amassed by the British and sent it to Britain. War beauty. War beauty was paid by the defeated rulers. You recall that after the failure of the Nawab of Aut Shujaud Dawla, he was required to pay 50 lakh Indian rupees as far in divinity. War beauty and plunder. These were the other sources of wealth of India sent from India to Britain. Bribery received by the British officials. This wealth was also sent from India to Britain. Then in addition to the Proper trade, they also engaged in fraudulent dealings by getting the profit through fraudulent dealings. This business profit also sent from India to Britain. G. A. Princip, he gives a graphic account of the transfer of wealth from India to Britain. It was about the transfer of the private wealth 
from Bengal to England. During the period between 1813 1820 about 1 crore 8 lakh rupees wealth was sent on an annual basis from India to Britain. Thus the private earnings of the officials and the English East India Company as well as the business profit formed the major source of revenue reigned from India to Britain. And in addition to all these business profit, plunder, war beauty, payments to shipping companies and insurance companies were paid from Indian revenue. These shipping companies and insurance companies were located in Britain. The payment of these companies were made from Indian revenue, Indian taxpayers' money. It was another form of transfer of wealth from India to Britain. It was 57 lakh Indian rupees annually between 1813 and 1820. During this period between 1813 and 1820, annually 57 lakh rupees was sent from India to Britain as payment to the shipping companies and insurance companies. Then there was third channel, remittance to the companies. For what purpose did revenue sent from India to English East India Company. It included the salary of the officials of the English East India Company in Britain. The salary of the officials of the English East India Company in Britain was paid from Indian money. It was another way of transfer of wealth from India to Britain. Another, the interest on loans taken by English East India Company from Bank of England. You now recall that in 1772, the English East India Company demanded 10 lakh British pound loan from the Bank of England. It resulted the passage of the Regulating Act. when. The officials of the company became rich. The company was in financially bankrupt. 14 lakh British pounds was granted to English East India Company in 1773 as loan on the payment of 4 percent as interest. The interest was 4 percent on the loan taken by English East India Company from the Bank of England in 1773. This interest was paid from Indian money. It was another way through which the wealth of India transferred to Britain. Dividends to the stockholders of the shareholders of the English East India Company in Britain also paid from India. It was calculated between 1 to 3 crore rupees per annum. All these came in known as home charges, payment to the officials of the English East India Company, payment of interest on loans taken by English East India Company from Bank of England, dividends to the stockholders of the company, all these came in known as home charges. During this time, you recall that Britain was undergoing the process of industrial revolution. This immense wealth the British got from India was used only partly for the process of industrialization in Britain.
Now, coming to the last subsection of this lecture, introduction of the railways. First of all, let us look at the, the reasons why the British introduced the railway in India. There were certain concrete reasons behind the introduction of the railways by the British in India. One, as you know, the British imported their manufactured products to Indian port, where from these manufactured goods were to be brought to the interior markets, interior parts of India from these manufactured goods were brought to the prominent parts of the country like Calcutta, Bombay and Madras. From this port, these manufactured goods were to be brought to interior markets. The markets were located in interior parts. Likewise, raw materials were to be collected and it was it to be brought in port from where these raw materials were enshipped to Britain. For these two purposes, railway was considered by the British as a chief mode of transport for transporting these imported British Manchester made goods from the port to interior parts of the country as well as the raw materials like cotton, raw silk from interior parts to the port. Another reason was that the English capitals, the English capitalists had been looking for an opportunity to invest their capital and earn further profit. Indian railway was considered as a safe haven by the British capitalists to invest their money and earn huge profit. The third reason was that the English companies, the English railway companies, they were looking for an opportunity to sell their goods, rail goods relating to railway, rails and even coal was imported from Britain to India during the first decade. These English railway companies were looking for an opportunity to sell their rail goods, engineering goods relating to railways. Both the British capitalists and these English railway companies exercised heavy pressure on British government to start railways in India so they could maximize profit. The British capitalists they could invest their money and earn huge profit. Likewise, the English railway companies would get market for selling their products relating to railways. Now coming to the Indian side, Lord Dalhousie, it was during the period of Lord Dalhousie as the Governor General, railway was started in India. Lord Dalhousie wrote to the British authorities to start the railways with the intention for the quick movement of the army to disturb it areas. So, if, uh, if railways were started, the army men would be mobilized from their camp to the disturbed areas very speedily. And again, not only against the, not only to the disturbed areas, but also to the Indian borders 
the Indian army personnel could easily be mobilized for repulsing any foreign attack, especially from Russia. During this time, Dalhousie feared Russian attack. These were the reasons behind the start of the railways in India. Railway company started as a joint stock company in Britain. And this English capitalist brought shares in these companies in the stock markets located in London. And these capitalists were to be encouraged in a business far away from Britain. And in order to encourage these capitalists, British capitalists to share, uh, to purchase shares for starting railways in India, the English East India Company guaranteed 5% interest on their investments. After getting this 5% guarantee on the capitals made by the British capital, the railways was started in India. And when railway was started in other parts of the world, the industries coincided with the railways also developed. But in India, the industries relating to railway did not develop. Particularly, engineering industry, iron and steel industry and mining. Because all these rail goods were imported from Britain to India. That is why these associated industries did not develop in India because of the introduction of the railways. Even coal was imported from Britain to India during the first decade. The first railway was started in India in 1853. This investment and the guarantee of the British government in India to this British capitalist further exploited Indian money because this guaranteed interest of 5 percent was Indian taxpayers money and this money was also paid in British sterling forcing India's foreign exchange expenditure in England. However, railway was introduced with the commercial interest. It brought some more effects which were favorable to Indians. It brought a modern technology in India later. Even though initially the railway companies brought these engineering and rail goods, later it caused development of technology in India. It also played a key role in unifying the country and developing the nationalist feelings among the Indians, which the which even the imperial Mughals had failed to create. Even though railway was introduced with the commercial interest in India, the Indians got an opportunity to travel from one part of the country to another part and to meet the people in different parts of the country. And it created some kind of unity among the Indians. Thank you students for watching my class. Thank you.
Hello, good morning everybody. I am uh, Raghunandan Sengupta. So, I will just give you uh, the a very brief uh, excitement area of finance which is quantitative finance and that has a huge market starting around about 10 years back and it is exploding exponentially. So, what uh, do we mean by quantitative finance? Quantitative finance is actually the application of different mathematical and statistical techniques in the area of financial markets, be it say for example, derivative pricing, be it in the area of say for example, portfolio management, be it in the area of asset liability management, be it in the area of portfolio management. We see that the application has exploded in such a way that there is a huge opportunity for people who have a quantitative background in mathematics and statistics, they can utilize those in the area of finance, but obviously with some prior knowledge of, of, of uh, finance as a subject. Now, when we say about quantitative finance, as I said, it is an area of applied mathematics and statistics applied in, in financial markets. Use of different areas, if somebody is interested to know, we have stochastic calculus, we have derivative pricing, we have operation research, we have quantitative techniques like differential uh, equations, stochastic calculus, time series and they are heavily used in the area of quantitative finance as I mentioned. Now, we all know that in, 2000, in, in 1997, the Nobel Prize in Economics, so it is basically the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics was given to the work of Merton and Scholz in the area of derivative pricing. And after that, there has been exponential increase in the area of, of quantitative techniques in, in, in quantitative finance and the, in the area of, of different type of derivative pricing. With the advent, moreover with the advent of, of high ended and sophisticated computing data, big data has come in a very big way where application areas starting from computing from different type of algorithm design have been taken up in such a big way that nowadays at least we are able to understand that how high frequency data algorithm trading can be utilized using the concept of quantitative finance in the area of, of finance as such. But there is a flip side also, obviously when, when, when there is a huge amount of development, so obviously due to some regulation errors or something, there has been some, some pitfalls which I think is should be a bullet point for people who are in really interested to take up quantity finance, they should be aware. So, consider the financial crisis in 2008 and later on and we are seeing different banks are failing, different financial institutions are facing a problem, countries are facing a problem like in Europe, in, 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 in USA. So, what should be done? So, the main thing is that even if you know the technique is best for people who are investors, who are private players, organizations like banks, governments should use these techniques in a very somber manner such that the application areas of quantitative finance using the techniques which we learn can be utilized in the best possible way to garner the overall the in depth knowledge a person has in trying to utilize these quantitative techniques in finance. And I am sure that people who have the background, who have the knowledge, who have the, the sophistication, who have the, the knowledge of the society can definitely use quantity finance in a very big way in trying to make their mark in this exciting field which you are going to see in years to come. And I am sure it will be a very exciting learning tool for all the participants who, who will take quantity finance as a, as, a, as a subject in years to come. Thank you and I, am, and I wish all the participants all the best and best of luck for the programs they will take. Thank you.